Hello, here we are at another live question and answer. This is week two, semester two, class two, with Jimmy, the Boston guy, aka the Boston guy. And Jimmy's having a lot of fun with, with his ottoman. Wait till you see the final product on that. He did a good job. Um, you watched, if you just watched the, the recent show, Jimmy was cutting out fabric. And uh, upcoming with some of these online classes, we're going to have some few, a few surprises for you if you sign up. I hope uh, that you sign up for these because we, we have a lot of fun too. And we're going to increase that fun with the increasing numbers of people that we're going to invite. We're going to have some guests that come on. Um, in, the up, in one of the upcoming online classes, not Jimmy's, we have a, a visitor from France with us. And she's upholstering and her, uh, she's, she's really wonderful. She's, she's a lot of fun, and she's really a good upholsterer. So she's been doing a couple of projects with me. So we're inviting her along with, with um, Michelle, actually. So uh, stay tuned for that, or sign up for that one. So uh, last week we were, we were going over the index of upholstery supplies, and um, I think what I want to do is pick up on that. And if I have time, please ask questions. Uh, that's paramount in this. That's the whole idea of these. Um, I want to, if we have time, show you how to do a slip seat quickly. I think I've done those on the YouTube, but I want to show you um, just how I do them professionally um, and how the speed increases as you get, as you get along in your, in your upholstering. So, so uh, please ask questions now. Get them in now because we may get busy. Um, so last week I was um, at the C's in the index. Um, we, 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 uh, we stopped off at Chalk what the chalk that we use, and we we're explaining that. If you saw my last one, you know that the chalk that we use in upholstery is a fine powdered chalk that doesn't stain the fabric. That's important. You don't want to be using school chalk or that colored chalk to be marking your cover. Uh, these are some of the tips that we talk about during the online classes, too. So I really think that um, the classes have good value. Uh, I really think that they're worth it. I think you're seeing much, much more than you do on the YouTube channels. Although we love the YouTube channel, um, we can only do so much on that, though. Um, we cover a lot of ground in the online classes. So let's look down the list. And we have uh, clinch back buttons, which I don't use. Um, clinch back buttons are the ones that you've seen. They, they, they're spread out with a little piece of metal. Uh, I don't use those. I make my own buttons and I use twine. But we'll get to that. I think we talked about buttons last week. Uh, and you've seen the type of buttons that I use. And um, they're, they're not those ones. Uh, so looking down, cotton. So I use a AAA cotton. There are three varieties of cotton, raw cotton, that you can use. And it falls under the category two of batting. Uh, the three varieties are A, AA, and AAA. AAA being the most fine cotton. As a matter of fact, I'm going to go grab some to show you. So, uh, AAA cotton is the most refined cotton or picked cotton. They, you know, there's, you can still see some of the seeds in this. But the other cotton, actually, the, the A and the AA, you can actually see there's actually dirt that you can see. I mean, it comes from the farm, so, so um, I don't want, you don't want dirt on your cotton. So if you're going to use cotton as a batting, and, and there are certain times where you use that, um, and sometimes where you use Dacron, sometimes where you use muslin, and so on. But make sure it's the AAA or the, or the better cotton, okay? So if you have any questions about any of these materials, too, as I'm speaking, on this live class, you can ask. Um, do we have any YouTube questions, Patrick, that, that came in? We, we, we yeah, I'm getting those now. Okay. Feel free to interrupt me with those questions, because I feel that you learn from your other, uh, from YouTubers and from up other people on, your online, on the online classes. So we understand that on the online class, on the, on the Q&A, not everybody can tune in at the time they're live, but, um, this, we're picking. We're trying to pick good time slots here. So, if you have any, uh, actually, if you have any uh, feedback for us, feel free to contact us. Um, so, looking down my list, um, we have a thing called curvies. Um, I'm going to show you. Actually, I'm not ready to show you this. But hold on one second. This is important. I'm going to go off camera for one second. Just 
So, there are five comments on here. Doug. This is ply grip, um, not curvies. Curvies, believe it or not, the name is a little uh, <laughs> deceiving. It's not as flexible as the ply grip. The ply grip was the original, and the ply grip is the best. I like the ply grip. It's, it's a little softer to use. The other stuff's really hard, uh, the curvies. It looks just like this, only I think it has three prongs. Uh, these have two prongs. This is used to close up outsides. This is a professional device, you know, instead of closing up with hand stitching. Which, by the way, in the class, we, we teach beginners how to hand stitch because they, I feel as though they need to learn the basics or the traditions of upholstery for us before they use this. This speeds you up, though. So if, you, if you're in a, if you're trying to profession, you know, up your profession. Uh, up your productivity, this for sure. And you've seen me use this, I think, on some YouTube. Don't forget to go on the channel and take a look. So that's that. Uh, do we have a question, Patrick? Uh, yes, we do. We have a few on here. Okay. First one's an easy one. Patricia asks, and thanks, Patricia. She's been asking a lot of good questions on YouTube. Yes, she has. Um, what's the brand of your stapler? Oh, yeah, I mentioned that. Um, this, this particular one, I actually had my long nose out, and um, this is a Rainco, R-A-I-N-C-O, -I -I Rainco, okay? The other one that I had, the low pressure one, is a, is, is a B-A, B-E-A. That one there, you, you've seen the blue one, you've seen me use a lot. That one's out of commission, by the way, I've had that for so long, and all of a sudden it decides to not work and that's why I have this one out today uh, but this long nose is nice to have too because this gets into some really tight spots but your equipment is everything your compressor believe it or not as far as noise goes that matters but if, if you got any compressor that builds up 80 or 90 pounds of pressure it's all you need um, with that gun with that low because I've explained that gun before that that BEA gun that's a low low pressure working gun that means on the low cycle on the gun, on the compressor that it still works most of the other guns including this one start to jam on the low pre on the low pressure so um, you're constantly opening this up and maybe taking a, a staple out as a matter of fact if I get to the slip seat you may see that happen with this good question Patricia keep keep them coming I love them any other questions before I move on in my index Patrick there's one more here okay Hello? Yep. All right. The question is from Lori. From Lori. Do you mind giving me your opinion on an idea that I have? I see that they make pillow toppers for mattresses that are that are baffled. I have a three cushion cane back sofa that I'd like to convert to a single cushion with a little crown. I want to be able to flip it over and use both sides. I was thinking that one of these mattress toppers could make a great envelope for a foam interior to make a nice single cushion. What do you think of that idea? I think it's an awesome idea and I love reusing things. You know, if you're a client of mine, if a client of mine is watching, they know when I, when I talk to them. I have a good, for instance, you know, this, this came to me talking about reuse. Um, or using products like like you're gonna do, Laurie. But this this is an outdoor furniture or three season porch which gets moisture. And it, this came to me. I took the cover off this. So I just have the foam. This is the old foam. And you no, know, the client knows for a little bit less money I'm just gonna keep the old foam because there's nothing wrong with it. And be, and, and uh, it's not moldy because they didn't use cotton. If you're going to do outdoor, I don't do a lot of outdoor furniture. As a matter of fact, the only outdoor furniture that I would do um, would be something that's closed. You know, a slip seat's closed. So cushions are a problem. Outdoor cushioning is a real problem. Because when you get rain, even on the monofilament thread that you're using, which you should use if you're doing outdoor cushions, you're going to get you're going to get it uh, it's going to fail after one or two seasons so i don't touch them for that reason because i want things to last longer than that but in this case so the customer reusing you know i'm reusing this um i'm not going to be putting cotton on because cotton will collect mold so i think your idea is a great one and i think that the down i want to check the down content that they use in that to see what it is because i would recommend the best uh, mixture for cushioning 
is 50% feather and 50% down. That's the that's the proper mix. Now, if you have something that has more down in it, um, you know, I guess you could still use it. But the the reason they use feather, the feather, the feather portion of the of the goose is has the stem in it. Okay, so you have a long stem, like maybe an inch long, and then a little feather at the end. The down comes from right here underneath the goose, right here, the breast area. So that that's actually just a just all feather. So it seems like the mix really mixes well, so it gives you good consistency and it, it also allows you to fluff it up better. So I hope that answers your question. I would go for it. I would experiment. I, I encourage everybody out there to experiment like that. So any other questions right now, Pat? Um, I'll keep looking. Okay. So we're going to move down our list. Um, let's see. Custom cushions. Wow, I could talk. We could talk a long time just about cushions. So, <clears throat> I use what they call an ultra foam medium for most of my things. Seats on seats, backs. I recommend. I don't recommend foam on backs. I recommend the 50/50 down feather mix, which I just which I just talked about on back cushions. Foam on back cushions. They have it. They sell a soft foam. That you, if you're going to use a foam, I guess you would use that if if people can't don't want to spring for the um, down and feather. But the thing about foam cushions on the back because it's soft, they'll shift a lot. The fabric will walk a lot, meaning every time you sit down on it, the fabric walks. Even if it's a millimeter over the course of a year, you'll start getting a cushion that you've seen them. You probably have seen them in your own house that just twist right around. So I wouldn't recommend. Uh, I would recommend the 50/50 down feather. Now, as far as the seats go, it's really an important, important part of the whole seating experience. Um, I like medium foam. If you're going to use foam, medium ultra foam, ultra with um, with a rapid decron. Now, there's a real custom seating, which is a which is down and spring. That's probably that's the highly recommended one for seats. So what that is, it's, it's a, on the inside, it's a Marshall unit. And then that Marshall unit is covered with a variety of Daycron and a little foam, a little, little, I think, burlap, things like that, just to, just to take the edge off the, the core of the springs. And then a wonderful wrap of down uh, that, that around that. And, and that, is, that presents itself as a really good cushion, really comfortable, and really lasts a long time. Um, but but everybody has their own opinion about about seatings too. Now the French, who I love, they have a uh, they put a lot of like 80% down in some of their cushion seat cushions. And let me tell you, that's just strictly for look, because what that does is it really gives you a real crown. As a matter of fact, when you have a cushion like that, the cutting on that cushion has to be different than what you probably used to if you're cutting cushions. Usually we cut cushions flat. But on that type of a, like a balloon, you need to actually form, you need to pattern it and you actually put pleats in the corners and everything else. I don't think that's a great, I think it's just a good look, you know, you, it's not a great seating at all. So anybody, if you have questions, I, most of the times, I mean, remember what upholsterers do, upholsterers are wanting to make everybody comfortable. That's our job is seating. So um, we want to try to optimize the experience of seating. You know, what the goal is in any piece that you upholster or custom make is to be able to sit down on a piece of furniture for hours on end and, and get up and not have a backache. And, and let me tell you something, the stuff, some of the stuff that's been produced, I won't mention any brand names, that's not, that's not a good thing, but um, the, you sit on it and five, ten minutes later your back hurts. It's, it's not even properly you know, I've shown you this in other videos, but I can show you here. So this is the seat at this angle, and this is the back at this angle. So you're probably talking about a six degree angle on the on the seat, and about a fourteen degree angle back on the back. That's that's what a human body wants to wants to recline at. We've got a live question, so let's. Oh no, it's not from. Live. It's not live. It's, it's actually another. A, another question from from the website. Uh, how do you decide how many springs should go in a chair? The one I'm doing was my grand's, 
and had five originally, but there's still quite a lot of space in there. Should the springs be close together? Mine are about two inches away from the center one and a similar distance from the edge of the seat. And of course, there's more than two inches between each of the outer ones. Should I, go, should I be going for nine or five? Likely to be sufficient? So, um, who is this? Uh, this is from Sozable. Sozable, you know, um, unfortunately you didn't tell me if it's an upholstered seat or if it's a loose cushion seat. So there is a difference. So if you have a loose cushion and you have coil springs, uh, unless you, do you see that, that she specifies uh, an upholstered seat or a cushion seat? Mm, no. She doesn't. doesn't okay. So. When you have a, a loose cushion on a seat, let's pretend this is a cushion, this is the seat where all the springs are, right? It's less important to have coverage. They call that coverage with the springs that you're talking about. Um, so five would be adequate if you have a cushion going over it. I would say though, if it's, so those would be smaller springs too. Um, so if you have an upholstered seat, meaning, meaning this is attached and your springs are bigger and you have a crown, right? You may want to add a spring or two, maybe two springs on your stiff seven springs. So, but you don't want them too close together. Um, you don't want them touching one another for sure, but you want to be able to tie them. They have to be really separate when they're tied because if you have one spring overlapping another one and you did a great job on everything else except one spring is overlapping on the other one and every time the client sits down, they hear a clicking noise. That is more, they associate that with a poor job. Um, just that one little thing. So it's important probably to have another way of looking at springs. When you have an upholstered seat, the coverage probably, I would say, would be about two inches from each other. About two inches. Maybe three. Okay? Three inches. Um, if, it's a, if it's a cushion seat, you could go a little bit more. The five probably would be adequate in this. So I hope that answers your question. Okay, thanks. Good questions, aren't they? Good? Yeah. I'm trying okay. to knock off a bunch, so sorry if these are old questions, but uh. So you got another one? Yep. Okay. This was asked by Debbie uh, about a month ago. Sorry, Debbie, about the slow response. We promise we're gonna get better with this. <laughs> so uh, I'm doing a rocking chair that has zigzag springs in the bottom. Do I need to run jute under the ZZ springs? And repeat that question, Patrick. Since I'm doing a rocking chair that has zigzag springs on the bottom, okay. do I need to run jute under the spring? Yeah, well, first of all, I'm not a big fan of zigzag springs. And um, I had a chair come in here the other day. i tell you the problem with zigzag springs. You might want to consider taking them out. And before I go on how, to, how, how you would approach that after you do that, um, I do want to tell you about a story. I had a wing chair come in here that was perfectly upholstered. It wasn't that old. It was it was a um, probably like a lower low to middle um, furniture store, but they use zigzag springs. And what happens? What 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 the problem is with the zigzag springs it puts a lot of stress on the frame, especially the front part of the frame. So you have they really stretch. Each one is stretched and clipped, and they, there's a tool that stretches them. And then you have about five or six of them across the whole front of this wing chair, for instance. And what was happening, the whole, both, the whole reel was turning up like, like this, and the legs were actually crooked. So I, I, they wanted to save the chair, which is what, I love doing this, I love saving furniture. The, the upholstery was great, but they were going to throw it away. So, oh, you know, for you know, $150 I can fix it. So what I did was I took the springs out, and I, I filled that, whole, after I took the springs out, I filled that up with that nice foam that I was telling you about. And then I webbed the bottom, and I put a piece of cambric on it. And, and they were thrilled, and the cushion sat really nice. You've got to be careful when you do this. You don't want to make it the cushion, you don't want the cushion to not sit flat. So you have to pay attention to that, not too much filling. So they were happy. So this chair, being an antique, I'm surprised it has um, zigzag springs. Uh, you may be able to go to coil springs. And if you want to go to a coil spring, you should see some of my tutorials. We do, we do have a, a how to tie an eight-way tie on there um, that you can look at. But that, that was a good question. Thanks.
I have another old question. That's a good question. I know you get this question a lot, so okay. I think it would be nice to answer. Okay. I'm not sure if you've answered it before, but it says, Rick at, uh, says... Oh, hi, Rick. Rick James. <laughs> Rick 1979. He left this about a month ago. Yeah, he's, says, a, good, he's a good uh, YouTube watcher. I'm nowhere near capable to teach how you teach, but uh, teaching the public, could that lead to undercut your business? Oh, that's a good question. No, it's just the opposite. If you have an upholstery shop, or if you want to start an upholstery shop, if you feel like you you have the capability of teaching, um, teaching would be the best thing for your business. I, I estimate that when we started teaching here, I think it besides the, the money that you get from each student, by the way, um, and um, what you can do is you can partner with the local adult ed too. They love they love the idea of an upholstery program. Because when you do an upholstery program, I think I mentioned this in another Q&A, most of the time it's the most popular class in the adult ed. It really is, if you're teaching it right. But I would estimate that uh, it increased the revenue 25 to 30% we started teaching, definitely. Because look at it, it you turn into an expert when you teach. You're, you're the expert, right, at that point. And um, people recognize that and they reward you for that. And a lot of times... You do get the, the the students' furniture. They say, oh, you know, this is too hard. Can you finish it for me? Not that you're doing it for that reason, though. But uh, it's funny how that works. And any type of buzz that you have in your business, and classes create a real buzz, you'd be surprised. I mean, I, I never took it to a concierge level, but, um, you know, if, if you could do that, too, you could offer wine when people are upholstering, as long as they scotch guard their fabric, right? Uh, <laughs> oh, speaking of Scotch God, that's the, that was one of the first lines of defense in upholstery in fabrics. But they've gotten now they've got uh, Nanotex and Krypton, and some of the Teflon. I, I'm not a fan of. It's bad for the environment. I, I don't know about Scotch God, but I, some of the newer um, technologies are environmentally friendly. So that's encouraging. So uh, I got off subject a little bit there, but um, no, I would encourage you. I would encourage you to uh, keep at it, get good enough that you can teach, open up a shop and become successful. As we move forward with these online classes, we're going to actually show. We're going to be coming up and next year is going to be an exciting year. Because one of the things I'm planning, and I hope I can pull it off, is to show you what a class looks like with 10 people upholstering at once. And, and, and uh, it's going to be a real challenge for my cameraman, I know. But it's really exciting. It's so fast paced. You see so many different projects. You learn so much. So we're hoping that that happens in the new year. So pay, you know, pay attention to the website, BroadwayUpholstreet.com. Right, Patrick? Yep. Any other questions? Broadway Upholstery School. Broadway Upholstery School. Broadway Broadway. At the school. Yes. <laughs> and uh, that's we're all caught up on YouTube comments. All caught up in the YouTube comments, but we love the YouTube. As far as we know, I think we, I think we, we, we may be missing some on there. We have so many videos, right, Patrick? Uh, yeah, I can tell you the exact amount. I think over a hundred. So we have over a hundred videos on YouTube, and I think that's a real public service. Uh, but you know, the difference between I, I can't stress it enough. I love teaching on YouTube, but it's just me upholstering. You know, so when I'm upholstering, I honestly. I would say, I would estimate three quarters of what I'm doing is it's so instinctive that I'm not teaching it. You're just watching me upholster. But when you join the online classes, I, I guarantee you, you're going to learn in one class more than my hundred, I would, I would say that, more than my 100 videos because those students are asking the questions. You're watching them work. And right now, if you hear that little tapping, Michaela is a beginner. She's taken out some French nails for me behind, behind, off, off camera. That's the tapping that you hear. But, you know, when she was doing those, she had all kinds of questions about tool use and, and you know, which is the best way to take out around finished wood, around, you know, the nail, how to get started and all that stuff. I, when we're teaching, I, I think it's true with, unless you're a really excellent teacher, I mean, really, really smart teaching. I, I'm not, I don't know where I'm in on that level. But I think most people, when they're doing a trade, they're doing it, and they're just doing it. They can't, I mean, we're talking, I'm talking a little bit, but not in the detail that these classes are offering. And I know you wouldn't be disappointed if you take these online classes. Right, right guys? Yeah. <laughs> 
I actually missed a question. We have one more. One more question. This was asked uh, yesterday. So okay. This, uh, Joseph wants to know: Do most of these upholstery tools that you're using also apply to car uh, upholstery? Yeah. Do you use it in car upholstery? Not. No, I don't think I one. To be honest with you, car upholstery is much different than uh, residential. So you have three. I guess you have four groups of upholstery. You have commercial. You have residential. You have um, automobile, and then you have boats. So um, I can do all four, but it would be impossible. It's like four lifetimes of, of work. Um, I'm, I do more, I do some commercial work, but most of my work, the bulk of my work, which I like, is residential because of the variety. And for instance, I don't know if the camera can see what's, this is what I'm talking about, variety. I had a chair come in the other day that was an atomic age chair or space age chair from the 60s. And this chair looks like a rocket ship. It's cool. And then behind me here, you can't see, this is a headboard that was made from an antique sofa. It still has the arms and the back on it and the bed goes in between. I've never seen that before. So that's why I like about residential. Um, but in, in automobile upholstery, though, I have to say, it could be very, very rewarding. There's mostly, if you're a stitcher, you need to be a good stitcher to be an automobile upholsterer. Because most of your work, if you're doing custom automobile, is on this machine here. It's not bench work. Most of my work is bench work. So you have to be a really good seamstress almost. You know, I wouldn't even say stitcher. Stitcher, I consider myself a stitcher, not a seamstress. The seamstress is even more refined. So you have to be that refined because you're doing all kinds of uh, channeling on, on seat cushions and little pipings and things like that. But it's a rewarding business. However, starting up an automobile business, upholstery business, requires a much more of a startup than, than what I do because you absolutely need a bay or two. Uh, a, you have to be almost like a, a mechanic with the bays. People have to be able to drive the car into your shop. <laughs> Hopefully not in a bad way, <laughs> but in a good way with the garage door open. They need to come in and they need to, and you need to work on their, for their, their car in, the, in a bay. So that's what makes it a little bit hard. That's why there's not many car upholsters, I think. That's a big hindrance for most of us. So that's a good question. But many of the tools, I would say hardly any. I don't think I could think of one of my tools. Maybe the plies for pulling or something. That's it. Now, all these are geared towards uh, residential and commercial upholstery. Good question. I'm just going to take a sip of tea. Before I get down my list here, I keep going on my list. I'm not sure if I'm going to get to this to this slip seat. I like to talk about my index here. So the next thing I have on here is um, Daycron. So Daycron, I use. Um, it comes at different thicknesses and different widths. I use a, a Daycron that's an inch thick. I don't like anything more than that. Um, it seems to be the most manageable Daycron. So if you're going to use a Daycron, which is a synthetic cotton basically, you want to do the, hot, the one inch. I'll tell you another, another good thing about the one inch, this is a little secret tip, is that you can split it. And when you split, when, when it comes to one inch, you can't really tear it. You need to use your scissors. But when you, when you, when you split it, you can actually use your hands to tear it. Now the reason that's important this is one of the things that you see in the class more than, and I don't think I've seen it on YouTube. Maybe, maybe I pointed out one of my YouTube videos, but it's always better to be able to tear with your hands a batting because what it does is, look at this, it, it gives you a feathering, okay, and you always want to just feather around, around an edge rather than cut with the scissors and leave a ridge. Does that make sense? So, so Daycron is a great batting. I don't use it everywhere. Uh, it depends on the fabric. You know, oftentimes the batting that you use depends on the fabric that you're using. So for instance, you wouldn't want to use a cotton cloth. You wouldn't want to use the cotton on a, co a, a white cotton cloth. Why? Because you'd be able to see the seeds in this. So I, I would select, the batting would be Daycron. Daycron is a man-made product. No, no cotton seeds, right? So that's interesting, right? So it's, it's like a recipe when, you, when you're cooking. If you leave one ingredient out or add another ingredient, it's going to come out different, right? So.
So, so the next thing, actually that I'm kind of excited about showing you, is decorative nails. The world of decorative nails. I have every decorative nail I'm going to show you in this, in this book right here. So, I'm going to bring it right up to the camera because this is kind of cool. As far as I know, now there used to be a much wider variety of nails. Can you see that, um, guys? Can you see that? Is that good? So the most common nail that I use in size nail are the French Natural, which is this size. Now, um, that's a glossy finish. And then, and then you have another French Natural nail down here, which I see a lot of the uh, companies now, the, uh, the cooler companies, they're using a lot of these bigger French nails in their furniture. And then you have different colored nails. Um, then you have a little fancy brass nails, right? In the old days, they used to have buffalo head, head nails and cool things like that. But um, this is actually a leather nail. That's kind of cool. And um, this is a cat's eye, an antique cat's eye nail. That's kind of cool. I'm just going to run down the list. So French natural half inch, most, most, most used. Small headed French nail which I don't use an awful lot. <laughs> you can imagine why. The smaller the nail, the more you put in, the more labor it is. So it's kind of cool work on the big ones, especially if it's to space them. It's a little easier. Most people want the nail chain, though, meaning one after another. And one thing I would, I would caution you against, okay, is do not use the nail trim. I do not like it. The nail trim um, is not a good idea. It comes every other 10 or 5 or whatever it is. You have to put a real French nail in. I call it a real one because it never matches up with the, with the strip. It's an easier way of doing it, but I can tell from a mile away if somebody used it. So if you're doing custom work, stay away from that. And I have a tutorial on. It shows you how to do French nails. Sounds easy, but when you see the tutorial, you'll know that putting a crown nail in one at a time it's not as easy as that strip, but the end result is much nicer, definitely. So we got um, flat finish natural nail, which I don't like as much, but on some antiques it looks nice. And then this is called the Daisy Oxford nail, actually, right? And then we have uh, pewter zinc. This is an Oxford hammered. Um, we have a, the very aged look Z finish. That looks like, like a tack that just came out of an old 100-year-old chair. That's kind of cool. And then we have the nickel chrome. And then we have the gilt brass. It's kind of cool. How do they ever use these? Use this on a modern piece once. But the, 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 the gilt brass, I can't remember any time that I used that one. Cat's eye I've used a couple of times, which is this one. And then we have a small-headed nickel chrome. We have a small-headed gilt brass. And the black leather-like uh, one that I, I pointed out. And then a white leather one. So it's kind of cool. I mean, as much of a variety as this is in the old days, we, we had hundreds of varieties. But today they're not offering that. So that's kind of cool. So, any other questions? No. Okay. So uh, let's just go down the list. And I'm actually at edge roll. So I'm going to grab some edge roll. So we use this, you just can't go over wood without um, edge roll, you know, like on the fronts of seats especially, actually. So I'm going to actually grab that chair from Michaela from a minute just to show you. Can I grab that from you for a minute? Let's see how she's doing too. This one's a lot tougher than yeah. the Yeah. So Michaela made a comment about how tough these nails, she did a job for me where the nails were in a, a wood that was um, a very, um, I would say, it wasn't a hard wood because the nails came out much easier. This is a hard wood frame. This is a very high-end piece of furniture. So that wood in there, that's probably a walnut or even a mahogany. That's why she's having a hard time with that. So the reason it's, it's difficult, too, is that she's got this nice finished edge here. And, you know, and she's doing a good job. Um, she's not, not using the, the tool to you know, for leverage and then denting the, the wood or indenting the wood. 
So what I want to show you about the edge roll, when you're looking at a piece of furniture, it's a mystery, right? Except for all you guys who have been upholstering, right? But um, edge roll. So this is the small edge roll. In the old days, they used to call this finger roll. Okay, now when I say finger roll to my supplier, he says, what's that? Is, are you ordering Chinese or something? I said, no, I'm ordering an edge roll. I said, okay, I'll take the small edge roll. That's what they refer to this as small edge roll. That, uh, I think they say a half inch. So underneath here and around the whole chair, as a matter of fact, is an edge roll. So when you're looking at this, when you're deciding about a chair and about how big you want it, you do, you do think about the edge roll. Um, so when I'm looking at this, I'm determining, I would determine that needed a medium edge roll. So I um, actually don't have a medium. This is the big one. So this is, this is the, um, we used to call this fox edging, okay? Fox edging, but now, now they just, I just say, give me the big finger roll, I mean the big edge roll, and they know what I'm talking about. There's also another type, this is the burl, this is the burlap with the paper fill. There's another type of synthetic, I would, I would not get that if I were you. Um, it, it doesn't last as long. The jute is used, when you staple into the jute, it tightens around that roll and it really does a good job. So this one would be too big for this. So there's one right in the middle that would be used for the edge roll here because what, the, what it does is it protects the fabric from coming around. Uh, it protects the fabric. It, instead of wood, it goes around the edge roll, which is um, softer, obviously. So I'm going to give this back to Michaela. Do you have any questions about, about how that's going for you, Michaela? Yeah. Except that it's a little tougher than before, right? Yeah. And that's where perseverance comes in because I have eight of these. <laughs> <laughs> it's not just one. <laughs> and there's no magnet that I know of. If anybody out there in YouTube land or online classes, if you know, if there's a magnet that I could use just to go right along here, I would like to know. I doubt it, but I would like to know. Here you go, Michaela. <laughs> Thank you. For your prop. Okay. Well, we're getting a lot, of, you know, the one good thing about <coughs> questions um, and answers is uh, when there's nobody asking a lot of questions, we get a lot of material in here, um, and I'm, I think we're answering a lot, so maybe, but don't be afraid if there's anybody has any question too. I, I, in the class, I, if you've taken one of my classes, you know. But and these I'm, live things are they're meant to be rewatched. We that, know a lot of people can't make the live. We know, right. We know that there are people who are going to rewatch this who, who are probably working. or, or it's, We have people from overseas. We talked about this before we started. We, there's nothing we can do about this. People all over the world are watching, so the time, the time zones are everywhere off the map. So we know, though, that people will be watching. So we're trying to uh, answer the questions. Now, for instance, with Jimmy, Jimmy was cutting fabric. Um, in, in class two. We're going to try to do this too, to try to, you know, talk about the class that you're watching. Um, Jimmy, I think, is doing a great job. Um, he, um, I was doing, I think, cutting, I was showing you how to cut around dining room chairs too. That cutting is a real problem for people. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you why. What I hear a lot from people is that it's counterintuitive. Um, so, so I think, I think I'm so used to doing it that I don't, don't realize, but when I'm trying to, to teach that, if you take, if you signed up for this class, just, this is what I'm talking about. Just that one thing, that segment, which is in, in another segment, it's in the class that I'm showing you. We pin away from Jimmy and I'm showing you how to cut. I think that's the value of that in the class is, is worth it. The, the, the whole class, the whole Fifty dollars is worth just that one segment that I showed on how to cut dining room chair cuts. Um, I, I explained to you um, what, you tr what, what the attempt is, what you're trying to do. You're trying to visualize how you want the fabric to go around these cuts, these posts. That really baffles people. And most people always do the wrong cut they, in the beginning. They always, they always do it wrong. So, so having a video like that is important. So, yeah. So, let's go down. We, we saw the uh, decorative nails. Um, talked about down and feather. 
I didn't talk about the downproof ticking. If you're going to make your own down cushions, you need to make sure you have a downproof ticking. And that's a cotton, that's like a muslin, except that it's treated with like a wax, like a shiny, glossy wax, which is supposed to prevent the stems of the feathers from coming out. It's called downproof ticking. Uh, always use that with, with, with if you're going to be using down. <clears throat> so we talked about the edge roll. So foam rubber, man, I, I could talk a lot about foam rubber. There's different, different, I mean, there's latex, <clears throat> chopped foam. I'll tell you, I stay away from all this stuff. Um, I, I go with, in my 42 years of experience, the ultra foam, to, in my opinion, is the best. And that's what I go with. Um, I, I've been really turned off latex. People, people want me to put latex or, or stay away from the memory foam in upholstery. Memory foam's not supposed to be used in upholstery because um, it, it stretches the fabric in a weird way. The fa yeah, the foam is, is squishing down a lot and then it's coming up. The foam is performing well, but what about the fabric? So what the fabric happens with the fabric is you put a lot of stress on the fabric itself and also the seams. So if you're using memory foam, I wouldn't use memory foam in a cushion, especially a seat cushion or anywhere. With the, with the foam that I use, the medium foam for seats, it, it works with the fabric and that with the Daycron. You have to put Daycron over the cushion. It works with the, it works with the fabric well, it works with the overall seating well, because that's why I picked it. And the latex, I got turned off latex a long time ago um, when I first started. Um, we used to see latex, all that powder that you see sometimes on, a, on the floor of a home is from latex cushions. Latex cushions dry out and they, and they powder out in, in, in a relatively short time. Um, and polyurethane um, doesn't, but you know, when we throw it away, it doesn't, it doesn't disintegrate either, so that's not a good thing. But I try to reuse as much polyurethane as I can for the environment. I think it's important instead of replacing everything that comes in here. And I tell my clients this, they save money as long as it's reasonable. Sometimes you can't help it if the, if the piece has um, become water stained or something like that. So, so ask questions. If, if you're there, ask some questions. If not, I'll, I'll go on. So, um, Gimp. Let me show you Gimp. Oh, Brady. Actually, actually, we'll just pull this over here. So this is a braiding. Um, it's actually called Gimp. G-I-M-P. It was one of the first uh, trims and the only trimming that we used to use, really. I mean, before double piping and things like that. As a matter of fact, there's something called a Gimp Tack. Let's see if I can get that handy. It's not handy. I don't need it. Well, I, I can't find it. It's up there somewhere. But a gimp tack is a small headed blue tack that was used to go right through the gimp. If you've seen some antique furniture, you've seen these little tacks holding the gimp, and they didn't even glue it. They used these gimp tacks. That's a real traditional way of, uh, of upholstering. So a lot of people don't like this because it's kind of dated. So what we do now is double piping. And, and again, you go on the YouTube channel, Broadway Upholstery School, and you'll see me... Uh, doing double piping, which is done in the same fabric. Now the other thing that you just saw me show you, the nails, the other, that's another way of finishing um, a piece of furniture. But that this comes in many colors, but hardly it hardly touches the color spectrum that's out there when it comes to fabric. So I mean, I would say you have thousands of choices of fabric colors, and you probably have, I think the last count maybe, 75 different colors gimps. So that means that unless you're extremely lucky with the with the color lot, you're probably between, this is another reason why people don't like this, you're between three, four, or five shades off on, on your color. So um, that's something to consider. I mean, you, you still could be using a, a you know, antique furniture that looked good on. Um, it, unless it's not a good match with the color, the fabric that you use. And so uh, we even use double piping on some old Victorian pieces. It really looks good. It really, it matches. So what that means is that when you have, when you have a gimp, you have the fabric, you have the gimp, and then you have the wood. 
So you have three transitions going on. But that's not a good thing. You're, you're trying to, what, what looks sleeker and better is to have one transition. So, so even though you have three elements, it's, it's, it's important to have the, the fabric and the gimp or the trim that you use really match well so that you're only transitioning to the wood. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, so that's that. That's the gimp. Actually, while, while I'm on, I'm going to jump off um, a little bit here. Well, glue guns was coming up. That glue guns is the next category. So I'm going to talk while I have that. I'll put that down there. Put this away. It doesn't look like I'm even going to get down the, the first index list today. So we'll, we'll keep this on going for our questions and answers because I find this very interesting to talk about. I hope you do too. So the glue gun. Um, this is an arrow. This is a, an industry glue gun. Um, I have uh, two settings on this glue gun, and I have it taped to the high setting. Um, so uh, what that means is this glue comes out really hot. It comes out to perform. Excuse me. On the low setting, it doesn't perform well. What that means is that you, you, you go to glue something, you, you tap it down, and sometimes it doesn't adhere. The, the high does. So this is a warning for um, too that it comes out really hot that you could get hurt so be careful. Um, but on your store bought glue guns like your arts and crafts glue guns I can tell you right now they don't make them hot enough. If you're lucky enough to buy one that has a two settings you can try on the hot setting always. But my experience with those guns that they sell in the, in the craft stores is that they don't make them hot enough so that people get hurt, but with I've, that, I've been burnt. But have you been burnt on this gun, a, a professional gun? Uh, well, I've never used a professional one. Uh -huh. I only use like the ones that they sell at you know wherever. I've, I still have a scar. When you when you got burnt, did you did you immediately take it off? Uh, I did the second time after yeah. learning the hard way. The first yeah. Time. So what happens is when you when you first get when you first feel this hot glue, you get it on your finger. For some reason, people don't react fast enough. You've got like two seconds to react. That's why if you're using, you notice how I have this a padded board. One is the obvious reason is that when I tip furniture, especially antiques over, they don't get damaged like if they want a wood, wood you know, horse. The other reason is because if I, have, if I get glue, I have, I have a place to immediately wipe the glue off. If you don't have a bench like this, always have a cloth. Because you'd be surprised, but if you're going to think, if you got glue on your hand, and you're going to think, oh, I don't want to wipe it on my shirt because I'll ruin my shirt, it's too late. You've just burnt, you know, really bad. But so have a have an old rag always when you when you you probably should anyhow have a rag. You should be cleaning up the head of the gun every once in a while, but maybe have a rag off to the left or right, an easy easy access. Okay, but the bench actually right now I'm feeling. Uh, glue that uh, from other jobs here where where I got it on my finger and I went like that and it's gone and um, it does help to have calluses and to be doing this work for, for a good long time so do we have any other questions Patrick no nope. because I uh, what to, I, I think we you know how much yeah, time a good time to wrap it up yeah I think so I mean we haven't had many questions today but we've got we're really happy with the people who are taking the online classes uh, hearing great, great things about that. I actually bumped into a woman here in town who, uh, down the street for lunch, came up to me and she said, I love your classes. I can't believe you and your son are doing that. You finally, you know, you, you, you're doing it. And so I was happy to hear that. Good positive feedback. We always like any type of feedback. If we can do a better job, let us know. Uh, please. I mean, that's, that's what makes us good. And please uh, stay tuned for the next question and answer, which is scheduled for... Next Friday, Patrick? Yep, yeah, should be Friday or it's Friday, Saturday, around that time. Great, and we love questions, so we'll see you then. Thanks a lot.